Welcome to the Tutor to You webinar on brain and behaviour held yesterday and now being recorded for those of you who need to watch it on YouTube or elsewhere. First of all, let's have a look. This is what we've got coming up next week. Webinars on cognitive psychology, social psychology and finally the week after looking at the qualitative method paper, paper three. So let's start brain and behavior more than just genetics this webinar will be split into three sections neurotransmitters and behavior hormones and behavior and finally localization of function and brain plasticity and the focus will really be on organization of what is the largest section of the biological approach in ib psychology so the learning outcomes for brain and behavior I've said here tweaking the guide because it is slightly different. The last learning outcome in the guide on what they call physiology and behavior is one on using brain imaging technology. Well, this is really something that I feel can be left till the end as a big overview. And instead, I've moved in the question on to what extent does genetic inheritance influence behavior, because I'm going to show you how you can use the neurotransmission information to answer this question as well. So here we have six learning outcomes, and I've color coded them so they connect to the color coding here. So the first one we're going to look at is actually focusing on neurotransmitters and behavior. And perhaps surprisingly to some of you, we're actually going to start with genetics. So the learning outcome is using one or more examples, explain the effects of neurotransmission on human behavior. Quick summary for the students on what neurotransmitters are and where they act. And then this is a diagram of Wikipedia because it's a Creative Commons image. But look here, we have the double helix for DNA sort of there to remind us all that actually our neurons are part of our DNA. Our neurons contain or our cells contain chromosomes that have genes and gene markers on them that are part of our, G our DNA. And apologies to any biology teachers for what is probably a very amateur description. Now the link to genetics for this learning outcome about neurotransmitters is the 5-HTT serotonin transporter gene. And Caspi's study, Caspi suspected that adaptations in this gene in what's known as the PR of the 5-HTT serotonin transporter gene, the polymorphic region, affected the incidence of depression in an individual. There's a possibility of having a short allele on both chromosomes, or a short long allele, short on one, long on the other, or long long allele. And the long, long allele pattern seem to offer most protection against a depressive response to stress. And the short, short allele seem to offer very little protection. Um, my tip is use a higher level biology student to explain alleles. They're sort of an alternative form of gene that can be passed on from parents to offspring. So you see here this picture again, a Creative Commons licensed image has the height gene locus there as these are the alleles, the ones labeled tall and tall. So you've got a link between the neurotransmitter question and genetics, which you'll be able to exploit when you get to a learning outcome on genetics. So learning outcomes that Caspi's study and the topic of inherited predisposition to a depressive response that this can be used for are three, two from the biological approach in the core and plus the abnormal psychology learning outcome to what extent do biological factors influence abnormal behavior. So when you have a choice of human behavior, short answer question, behavior for the extended response question and abnormal behavior, it really helps if you choose the same behavior. And depression or major depressive disorder is a very good way to go because it allows you to use this study extensively. And let's face it, we are trying to cut down the number of studies that our students have to use. So 
This is the exam question that comes from the learning outcome about neurotransmitters. It's usually describe, outline, explain how one or more neurotransmitters affect human behavior. So this is how you could answer it using CASPI, and you can show this diagram to your students. One example of one neurotransmitter and one effect. If you want, you can also choose another neurotransmitter and another behavior as well, acetylcholine and memory and guys and born study. But students do not have to do this. Unlike the hormones question, the neurotransmitter question will always be one or more. However, when we get on to essays, it may be useful for students to know a second neurotransmitter. So by all means, feel free to teach them the guys and born acetylcholine and memory, and CASPI, Guys and Born, and all the other studies we're going to look at in this webinar are actually provided in our key studies series by tutor to you So you don't have to write the summaries yourself. We have them available. So let's look at the essay questions now. The first one is the one from the biological approach in the core with relevance with reference to relevant research studies, to what extent does genetic inheritance influence behavior? And the second one is the abnormal psychology option question. To what extent do biological factors influence one abnormal behavior with which you are familiar? And here you're going to exploit the overlap with the short answer question because you're going to start by using CASPI. Caspi's argument about neurotransmission and depression is that genetic inheritance is mainly responsible. Genetic inheritance affecting neurotransmitter is a biological factor. So you're covering both genetic inheritance and biological factors. McGuffin et al. support this argument by looking at the concordance rate of depression in twins. McGuffin et al.'s research was actually earlier Caspi et al. 2003 is the later example of Caspi's research. They did do earlier research as well. And then we have Bring It Right Bang Up to Date with Matthews et al., which say genetic inheritance is partly responsible. And this is really a, a behavioral genetic approach. Again, we have the key study on Matthews. Now, these questions are both to what extent questions. All but the most sophisticated of students will really want to approach this by giving a counter argument. Counter argument can come from cognitive triad, Beck, or social factors, Brown and Harris, or any other argument with which the student is familiar. Remember, it's the argument that's important. The studies are only used to support the argument. Okay, so here you have one, two, three, four studies that you can use again and again to answer the short answer question but also to answer the extended response question. So neurotransmitter and genetics, if you pair them both and make the behavior depression, you're saving yourself teaching things that you're not going to go back to again. All right. Same with the learning outcome, using one or more examples, explain functions of two hormones in human behavior. Note, students really do have to learn two for this learning outcome. So again, choose hormones that you can use later, depending on what your options are going to be. If you're going to be teaching health, you might want to teach leptin and cortisol. If you're going to be teaching about human relationships, you might want to teach testosterone and oxytocin. I'm actually going to be teaching about abnormal psychology and human relationships in my higher level class. So I'm going to choose cortisol and oxytocin. I like to choose those as well because both are clearly also located in the brain. Oxytocin directly, because oxytocin is secreted by the pituitary gland, and cortisol indirectly, because the pituitary gland stimulates the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. So we're still focused in the brain. And here's a summary of that for the students, really. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland and is responsible 
for stimulating and controlling the release of hormones from this gland. And the pituitary gland has two lobes which re release different hormones. The anterior lobe on the left hand side there releases ACTH, which stimulates the adrenal cortex and the release of cortisol. And the posterior lobe on the right releases, typo there, oxytocin. So these are going to be the two that I'm going to focus on when my students get this question. Describe or explain or outline the functions of two hormones in human behavior. Students need to be able to say what a hormone is and what the difference is between a hormone and a neurotransmitter. And then they can go straight into describing the function. All right, now cortisol levels are very important when it comes to stress and depression and also memory. Higher cortisol levels seem to hinder recall of episodic memories, memories for events, okay? Oxytocin is very important in trust, love, mothering. So both of these fairly recent studies can be used to help students describe the functions of two hormones in human behavior. Remember, they don't have to go into depth describing the studies. They do need to describe the functions of the hormones. Okay, so this is something to be very clear of with them. Now to move on to the third section, and perhaps the most challenging. Explain one study related to localization of function in the brain. This is fairly simple. This is a short answer question, and this short answer question comes straight from the learning outcome about localization of function. The study I usually choose is Maguire, because again, Maguire can be used for this one, and if you see here further down, it can also be used for a question on plasticity. Explain one effect of the environment on a physiological process. Because the brain changed in response to the learning activity that was being undertaken. Now, some of you may have noticed that actually the plasticity question, the environment and physiological process question, is usually an essay question. So this is how you would use Maguire to answer the essay question. The essay question will often be worded like this. Discuss two effects of the environment on physiological processes. So first, the students need to say what that means. It's how the learning environment or poverty in the environment can change the brain structure. So, Maguire looked at learning environment, spatial memory, spatial learning, and changes in the hippocampus. Van Dongen et al. looked at activity levels, processes in the hippocampus, when students were trying to remember things after they had exercised four hours after their exercise in recall. So the students were given something to learn, they waited for four hours, they then exercised and then they recalled and their retention was improved and the activity level in the hippocampus, which is the physiological process, was also raised. On the other side, we have poverty of environment and changes in brain. This is the only animal study I actually use because it's so related to poverty in childhood affecting the temporal lobe region of the brain. So Rosenzweig, Bennett and Diamond, poor environment resulted in less gray matter in the cerebral cortex of rats. And it doesn't say human physiological processes in this section of the course, so you can use Rosenzweig, Bennett and Diamond. And then Pavlakis et al. did a huge meta-analysis of research showing how poverty in childhood does affect the brain structure. And then finally, a very challenging question. Examine one interaction between cognition and physiology in terms of behavior. Evaluate two relevant studies. The most important thing here is that students are able to give examples of physiology, cognition and behavior. Now, it's possible to do this 
using HM, physiology being the damage to the hippocampus, HM's brain, cognition being memory, and the behavior being the amnesia. It needs to be separated out very well and the interaction between the cognition and physiology needs to be described very well, but students can use that. I prefer to use mirror neurons because I think there is a clear example here and also there is much debate about it. So the teaching method for this can be debate. So mirror neurons, the mirror neurons are the physiology, the observation of others' actions is the cognition, and the empathy is the behavior. Okay, so when you are observing others' actions, you are thinking about others' actions, you are alert to others' actions. The visual field in your brain is acting as well. Okay, so you can use the early Italian monkey studies to explain the theory behind mirror neurons. You can then show your students YouTube videos on mirror neurons and autism. Ramachandran claims they are the markers of civilization, but his claims are contentious. And more recent research is skeptical, and there's a lot of recent research even questioning whether mirror neurons exist in humans. After all, it's a large leap from activity in the prefrontal motor cortex um, to the existence of mirror neurons and, of course, them demonstrating empathy. However, evaluate two relevant studies. Jacoboni is a classic study. Jacoboni found that the mirror neuron system seemed to show an understanding of intention and an understanding of intention is translated by Jacoboni as showing empathy. However, there's an evaluation here of the study. The schulte rutter study was a little bit better controlled in that they had uh, control subjects who were non-autistic and autistic subjects and they did a comparison of the areas of the brain that were activated. Okay. The discussion could certainly be around the controlled experiments that seem to show extra activity in the prefrontal motor cortex. There's a Guardian article that was published in August 2013 that is also excellent on this. So, a lot there on the brain. The question then comes, we are not biologists, how much do we need to know about the brain and how much do our students need to know about it, especially those not doing um, biology? Well, they do need to know about the four lobes and they also need to know a bit about the bit inside. All right, too much to do in a webinar for now, but there are excellent resources on YouTube for teaching about the brain. And there are exercises you can do. This table, for example, could easily be printed and chopped up into a card sorting activity. Again, it's only using studies that we've published as tutor to you. And you can make links with the relevant studies and the relevant processes. I'm sure you can think of more to add. Uh, the Fink et al. study is one on autobiographical memory. Autobiographical memory is a more emotional memory. But when you come to uh, cognitive memory, flashbulb memory also relates to the amygdala. So again, that could be used when you get to cognitive. And talking about the cognitive approach, when you finish teaching the biological approach, if you do choose to teach it first, there's a nice link here to the cognitive approach. Get the students to make Venn diagrams, maybe using the learning outcomes from each approach and get them to decide where the overlap is. There is a big overlap. And while we have to be careful not to put the purely biological in the cognitive or the purely cognitive in the biological, it's a good thing to be able to exploit these and use the same studies for both. Examples of studies you can use for both. One of the best examples is HM. But be careful if you are using HM to talk about brain damage, for example, and the effect on behavior, then use Suzanne Corkin's research. And if you're using HM as an example of a case study and cognitive research, then use Milner's research with HM. So it's just worthwhile being aware 
that you have to use the studies in the correct way. Same with Schachter and Singer. You can use Schachter and Singer to show the effect of adrenaline on behavior, clearly biological. You use Schachter and Singer for the two-step cognitive appraisal theory of behavior, clearly cognitive. So use the studies in the right way and then you'll be fine. Again, a reminder about the upcoming webinars and who to contact if you have any question, how to sign up for the future webinars. And of course, don't forget to join our Facebook page or encourage your students to join the student Facebook community. Goodbye for now.